Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Some of you need to have a good old wrestling match with God. And you need to say, God, I'm going to get this straightened out. I have not lived right. And the devil's going to say, it's too late for you. And you say, I am not going to let go of praying. I am not going to let go of seeking God until he blesses me. And I tell you what, God likes that kind of determination. He likes that kind of spirit that says, I will not give up. start, how we get started in life to me is not nearly as important as how we finish. And you know what? It's not over yet. You've all got plenty of time to turn things around. And you know what? Even if you're an older person, you think, well, I don't, you know, I don't have as much time as, as you think. If you decide in God's favor, he will count it as if it's already done. Let's look at 1 Samuel 15. I have to show you how this thing works. Samuel told Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now listen and heed the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have considered and will punish what Amalek did to Israel. How he set himself against him in the way when Israel came up out of Egypt. So God is basically saying, I'm going to deal with your enemies. Now you go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy how much? All. All that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Now let's look at verse 8 or verse 7. Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, and he took Agag king of the Amalekites alive, although he utterly destroyed all the rest of the people with the sword. So what did he do? He did part of what God told him to do, but he did not do all of what God told him to do. And the thing is, he was totally deceived. He really thought that his sacrifice was going to appease God when really what God wanted was all. Now, I'm going to say something that probably everybody won't like, but it needs to be said, and maybe especially for some people watching by TV. You know, the Bible says bring all the tithe. <laughs> A full tenth of your income into the storehouse. All the tithe and the offerings. That there might be meat in my house. That, that the means might be there to help people in need. You give a tenth of what you have to help other people, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you that you cannot contain. Now, that's what the Bible says. You can do what you want to. Can you go to heaven if you don't tithe? Yes. Your forgiveness is not bought with a tithe. It's bought with the blood of Christ. But will you have the same protection on you that other people will who obey God? No. <laughs> Come on, I don't want to leave town depressed. And see, I'm telling you the truth. I know when I say that out of all these people here, in all probability, there's a whole lot of people that aren't doing this. And I've already taken all my offerings this weekend. I'm not telling you this because I'm getting ready to try to get some more of your money. <laughs> and those of you watching my television, you can just sit there and watch and not even tell anybody you ever heard this if you want to. But, <laughs> you know, the point is, it's what the Bible says. And God doesn't need our money. He's trying to give us His plan for our protection. He's trying to give us His plan for our success and prosperity. He's trying to give us a life that is so amazing that we will just not even hardly be able to take it in. I will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so great that you will not be able to contain it. God can take the 90% you have left and make it go a whole lot further than the 100% did. And you know what? It's not too late. If you've never done it, it's not too late. Well, you know, you say, well, it's just a bunch of preachers trying to get your money. Now, come on. 
That's no different than what Saul did. It's just making an excuse for not doing what you know the Bible tells you to do. Come on. Yes, there are people that are dishonest, but you can find good places to do your giving that have a proven record of bearing a lot of good fruit. Amen? Cast all your care on God, for He cares for you. There's a lot of alls in the Bible. Well, Samuel did not do all that the Lord told him to. Years ago, when God first called me into ministry, 32 years ago, I was working a full-time job. I had three children at the time. When you work full-time and you have three children, you are very, very, very busy. And I was teaching one home Bible study in our home on Tuesday nights, working full-time. And God, really, you know, I, I was sensing that I had a call on my life to, to teach people everywhere. God gave me a scripture. He said, I want you to hold out to all men the word of life. And so I knew in my heart or felt in my heart that God had something much larger for me to do than just teach a home Bible study, but I wasn't ready. And you know, when God anoints you for something, that doesn't mean you're ready to step into it. You may feel a call of God on your life so strong you can taste it. That doesn't mean you're ready to step into it. God's got the thing prepared for you, but now he has to prepare you for the thing. And he doesn't need a bunch of disobedient people trying to serve him. So God began to put on my heart that I needed to quit my job, stay home with my kids, take care of them, but also be able to arrange my schedule where I could have lots of time to start studying the Word. I wasn't in a position to go leave and take off and go to Bible college to get some kind of training, but... The Holy Spirit trained me for this ministry. But I had to give him time to do that. Well, I was afraid to quit my job. When I was growing up, nobody ever really took care of me. I mean, even little things like my class ring and my graduation dress, anything that I had, I had to work and pay for it because my dad was not a generous person. And so I was accustomed to taking care of myself. And Dave and I were doing pretty good financially. We, had, we were your average suburban couple. We had two cars. and You know, we weren't wealthy, but we had enough to have a nice life. Well, if I quit my job, our bills were going to exceed our income. And so one of the jobs that I had done in the world for a long time was bookkeeping. So I knew the debits and the credits didn't match. And I was just plain scared. Has God ever asked you to do anything and it's just, you've just been plain scared? Okay. Well, the only way that you ever overcome those fears is by confronting them. You can't run from them. Well, the pressure was there. You know how it is when God tells you to do something. That pressure is there and it's not going to go until you obey. Well, instead of quitting my job, I quit my full-time job and I got a part-time job. Man's mind plans his way, but God directs his steps. Well, I ended up getting fired, <laughs> which that was just not me, you know. I mean, I, I was a good employee. I was a hard worker, and I'd never been fired from a job. And so the bottom line is, is God was saying, like, we're going to do this my way, or we're not going to do it at all. And it's possible that some of you are having some circumstances that you just don't understand. It's like, what in the world is going on? And, you know, maybe, maybe this is not the case with everybody, but some of you, perhaps if you would really get honest before God and start looking back, maybe you're trying to give God part-time obedience. You're, you're okay with this, but you're not quite as happy as I'd like you to be. <laughs> Saul almost did all that God asked him to do. Now, let's watch how deceived he was. Verse 9. Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, oxen, fatlings, lambs, and all that was good. But they would not utterly destroy all that was undesirable or worthless. 
Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret making Saul king. For he has turned his back from following me, has not performed my commands. And Samuel was grieved and angry with Saul and he cried out to the Lord all night. When Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, he was told, Saul came to Carmel and behold, he set up for himself a monument or a trophy of his victory. Now we're starting to see already what the problem is. He's got the big head. He's thinking he's more important than what he really is. And when we start acting like that, we lose the reverential fear and awe of God. And we begin to believe that we can kind of tell God what to do instead of him telling us what to do. We need to not be presumptuous. God is God and he means what he says. Verse 13, Samuel came to Saul and said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have performed what the Lord ordered. Deception. And Samuel said, Well, what then means this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, Well, they, we brought them from the Amalekites. The people, <laughs> he ain't even taking responsibility now, the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. <laughs> now they're blaming it on God. We kept all the good stuff to give it to God. That makes sense, doesn't it? Why should we get rid of all the good stuff? You know, people say, well, that doesn't make any sense. You know, I'm already struggling financially. Why should I give away 10% of my money? Doesn't make any sense. You just do it because God said to do it. You don't need any other reason. Just because God said to. That's it. It doesn't seem fair to forgive your enemies and bless those that have hurt you. When God put it on my heart to buy my, my mom and dad a home and move them close to me and take care of them until they died, I'll tell you what, that did not seem fair. It did not make any sense. Why should I do that after what he did to me? But it was what God said to do. And I, I, don't, I don't even have the time to tell you the numerous blessings that poured into my life after that obedience to God, which, by the way, was probably one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do. Take care of him? I didn't want to even see him. Take care of him until he dies? And, you know, my first thought was, what if he lives a long time? Come on, don't act like you wouldn't think the same thing. <laughs> and he did live a long time. <laughs> and it cost a lot of money. Took a lot of my time. But ultimately, he accepted Christ. We baptized him. And I know today that he's in heaven. I thought God was being unfair to me, asking me to buy him a house. Dave and I didn't, we only had a little bit of money saved, and now we're going to take it all and do that? For somebody who abused me for 15 years? You've got to be kidding. See, Saul thought, this doesn't make any sense. Why should I get rid of all this good stuff? We can just, but God said all. And when God means all, he means all. When he told me to quit my job, he meant quit your job. He didn't mean go get a part-time job. You know, not too long ago, I did something that hurt somebody's feelings. And after I went through all my stubbornness and this and that, and well, you know, they this and they, 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 you know, God just said, you just take responsibility. Just say, listen, I'm sorry that I behaved that way. And man, I tell you, I wanted to give excuses. I didn't feel good today. I this, I that, I something else. And so, you know, I could have apologized and said, you know what, I'm sorry I acted that way, but, you know, I, I really just didn't get much sleep last night. I didn't feel good today. But see, I wouldn't have been obeying God fully. I would have been obeying God partially. And it was so hard for me to say, listen, I'm sorry that I did that and there's no excuse. Pray for me that God will give me more self-control in the future. It was just like, God, you have got to be kidding. 
because I thought, you know, this person don't do everything right either. <laughs> you know how hard it is when there's an issue between you and somebody else to just take full responsibility and make no excuses? But see, every time we disobey God, we always have an excuse. We're not going to say, well, you know, I was just disobedient. <laughs> Saul had his excuses. Hey, this stuff's good. What sense does it make to get rid of the good stuff? Well, he ended up losing his whole kingdom. And so here's a guy who started out right and ended up wrong. I'd rather be the guy who starts out wrong and ends up right. So the good news today is if you've started wrong, if you walked in here today wrong, if everything that I've said to you has, this morning has just convicted you almost beyond belief, that's okay. Because today you can make a decision that will turn things around in your life. And when we make a right decision for God, all the past is wiped away. We no longer have to drag it with us. It's gone. Now, Jacob was a man who cheated, lied, connived, stole his brother's birthright. I mean, he was just a real case, let me tell you. But eventually, he turned around, got tired of running, tired of living the way that he was living. And I won't take the time to go there, but in Genesis 32, verses 22 through 28, we see well, no, I am going to go there because I think this is good. Genesis 32. See, that was my plan not to go there. The Lord said, go there. All right, Genesis 32, 22. Now, just keep in mind that, you know, after Jacob lied and stole his brother's birthright, then he spent the rest of his time after that running from his brother because he was always afraid his brother was going to kill him. You see, when we do the wrong thing, we always end up running from something. And you know, you have to keep in mind, you know, I'm not just preaching to you today, but millions of people all over the world. And so, you know, you may be so obedient, you may be so dedicated and committed, but I tell you what, there's a whole lot of folks watching right now that your life is in a huge mess. And it's simply because you've tried to ignore God or bargain with God, you've tried to give part-time obedience, maybe you date God on Sunday morning and the rest of the week, come on, God wants more than 45 minutes on Sunday morning and us looking at words on an overhead pretending to worship Him with our mouths while our lives are far from Him the rest of the week. God is not looking for singers of songs. He's lo looking for worshipers. Worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Saul was moving further and further away from truth. He was getting more and more into self-deception. Why? Because he wanted to do things his way. Jacob, on the other hand, had started out a liar, a cheat. He got tired of that kind of life. He saw the fruit of it. He saw the results of it. Now he's saying, I don't want to live like this anymore. So let's look at what happens. Verse 22, but he rose up that same night, took his two wives, his two women servants, and his 11 sons, and passed over the Jabuk. It was a river. And he took them and he sent them across the brook. Now watch this. And also he sent over all that he had. <laughs> and Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. I love this scene because here we have Jacob. He has everything, all this stuff. And he says, I can't live like this anymore because no matter how much stuff you have, if you don't have peace inside, you don't have anything. The most beautiful movie star in the world. The most beautiful woman in the world right now. Will someday have wrinkles, gray hair, and maybe a walker. And what is she going to have then if she has nothing inside?
The richest man in the world on his deathbed is not going to ask for his bank balance. So Jacob came to a point where he said, I cannot live like this anymore. Now get this scene. So he sent everything that he had, all of it, across the river. And he stayed there and said, okay, God, <laughs> I got to get a new plan for my life. And the Bible says that he wrestled with the angel until daybreak. And the angel kept saying, leave me alone. And he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Some of you need to have a good old wrestling match with God. And you need to say, God, I'm going to get this straightened out. I have not lived right. And the devil's going to say, it's too late for you. And you say, I am not going to let go of praying. I am not going to let go of seeking God until he blesses me. And I tell you what, God likes that kind of determination. He likes that kind of spirit that says, I will not give up. It is not too late for me. If you could win the award today, for the person who has lived the worst, you can still have a new beginning today. Today, you can cross over the river. Or you can send everything that you have across and say, none of this means anything to me if I'm not right with God. None of it's worth anything if I'm not right with God. Let me tell you, it is the most wonderful thing in the world. <laughs> When you are no longer fighting everything in your life. When you just say, you know what? This is the life that I have. Maybe it's not somebody else's life. Maybe it's not the life I thought I wanted. Maybe I feel like it's been unfair. But this is the life that I have. And God, I thank you for it. You know things that I don't know. You have a purpose I don't understand. And God, I am going to take it and do the very best I can with it to live for your glory. Well, Joyce, you know, I'm a good singer. I want to be a worship leader like Matt. Or I'm a good Bible teacher. I want to have a ministry like you. Well, you know, whatever God wants to do, if you're obedient, he'll do it. You don't have to try to make it happen. People come to me and say, how can I start my ministry? I want to laugh at them. It's like, you better hope you don't start it. You just better hope that you don't go start it. Because if you go start it, you're going to be the one that's going to have to try to finish it. And somewhere in the middle, you are going to get totally worn out. It's amazing how life changes when your soul is at rest. When you have peace inside. I said last night, and it just kind of came up out of my spirit, something I hadn't even really thought about, you know, consciously. And I've been thinking about it ever since I said it, that today, I'm able to do everything that I do that it takes to keep a worldwide ministry going. And I have a lot of people that help me. But I teach a lot. I need a fresh word for people. All the time because of being on television. I can't have 12 sermons and just go around the world and preach those 12 sermons. I mean, I have to have new stuff all the time. I'm writing. I'm managing. I'm praying. I'm seeking God. And it's easier for me than it was when I had one Bible study with 25 people in it. It's, this is easy for me compared to that. You say, well, what sense does that make? Because then I did not know how to let my soul rest in God. I was trying to change Dave. I was trying to change my kids. I was trying to change myself. I was trying to make all these people that came to my house want to do the right thing. It was always me trying to do everything that needed to be done. I didn't know how to trust God. And the Bible says those who have believed do enter the rest of God. You can only enter the rest of God when you believe that God can do what you can do. With man it's impossible. With God all things are possible. And if he wants to do it, he'll do it. Well, God wants us to keep him first in all things. And if we don't, to be honest with you, nothing else really works right in our life. 
There's such a great scripture in Mark 12. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, all your soul, and out of and with all your mind and with all of your strength. This is the first and the principal commandment. It's so important that we do that. And to be honest, our lives can get so busy and so full of so many things that it's very easy to suddenly, without even realizing we're doing it, let God begin to drift to the background of our lives. We always want to keep Him first in everything. First in your time, first in your finances, first in your decisions, first in everything that you do.